Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes as always and today I'm joined by Dr. Marty Hazelton. She is professor in the departments of psychology and communication as well as the Institute for Society and Genetics at UCLA in the US. Her research focuses on evolution and human behavior, social psychology, interpersonal communication and social endocrinology. Her empirical work work explores intimate relationships, sec sexuality, olfactory communication, psychological sex differences, social inference, evolution and health, and the effects of reproductive hormones on human behavior. She is the author of the book that we're going to focus our conversation today on, Hormonal, the Hidden Intelligence of Hormones, How They Drive Desire, Shape Relationships, Influence Our Choices, and Make Us Wiser. So Dr. Hazelton, and thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to everyone. Of course, yes. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Okay, great. So uh, my first question would be, the title of your book is Hormonal, and it focuses right. mostly on female sex hormones and the effects that they have on women's behavior. <laughs> but you're not saying there or suggesting that we men are not hormonal as well, right? We also oh, no. have our yeah. hormones and they also influence yeah. our behavior, right? Absolutely. Men are hormonal too. It's just, it's a little different. And the, the word when it's applied to female psychology versus male psychology, usually the, the intention is somewhat different. And, and actually, usually people don't even refer to men as being hormonal. That was a word that's been pretty much reserved for, for women. But um, a lot of the things that control our behaviors, um, even if our behaviors are somewhat different across men and women, you know, the, the, the things that are involved in controlling the behaviors are similar. Um, so men most definitely have hormones that are affecting their behavior. Um, and men's hormones make them um, nudge them toward a variety of things that, that I think actually we could put in the category of hormonal, um, including uh, their sexuality, including um, aggressive impulses, and, and so on. Um, so there are positive and negative things. People have tended to think of using, use the word hormonal for more negative uh, behaviors, but um, I think that it's time to take back the word hormonal um, because our hormones do a variety of things for us. Um, and indeed, um, are pretty remarkable in um, in how they prepare us for a whole variety of different life tasks across our lifespans. Um, so, you know, I think I, I, my hope was to sort of reframe that word and take it back and show that um, hormonal is not a bad thing necessarily. Yeah, that's great. Do you consider yourself a feminist or not? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've already had other evolutionary psychologists who also present themselves as feminists on the show, like mm -hmm. Catherine Salmon, Viviana Wick Shackleford, Marian Fisher, and others. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because people, when they think about evolutionary psychology, or at least what we learn from evolutionary psychology about human behavior, they tend to associate it with some, uh, with the right wing, for example, with right-wing politics because I mean it's about innate stuff about biological evolutionary right. stuff things that we supposedly can change but right. uh, but that's not really the case and I guess that you you would agree with me we I, really I have to consider what are the real sex differences that exist between men and women to be able right. to aspire to a uh, an equal an egalitarian society, right? Yeah, so I'd say two things about that. The first is that um, there being a biological foundation doesn't mean that those things are, um, you know, whatever behavior we're, we're talking about doesn't mean that it is out of our control somehow. Um, it just, um, so that's the first thing is that, you know, there's not a tight one-to-one -one relationship between a, a biological factor and what a person chooses to do. Um, so I think that that's based on a fallacy, that idea that if you want social change, you should ignore biology or you should seek, seek to minimize um, biological explanations. Um, and the second thing is that to the extent that we want to um, control our own behavior or have access to 
um, technologies and policies that might make the world a better place for everybody, we better understand what things are affecting human behavior. And that that includes biology is sort of a no brainer. Um, you know, and so we absolutely have to have that as one of the tools for us to understand um, everything about ourselves. And, and for women psychology in particular, I think we absolutely have a right to understand everything about our evolved biology and understand everything about our biology. Um, and so be, if we are concerned that perhaps um, women are not always getting all of the opportunities that we would like for them to, to receive, um, it doesn't really make sense to, uh, and so if, if we have that concern and if, we, if then we also believe that biology plays an important role in the preferences, let's say, that men and women have, it doesn't mean that um, we can minimize or, or ignore or squelch research that shows that there are those biological factors and then achieve whatever it is that we're trying to, to achieve. Let's say it's, it's equality in pay, equality in opportunity, um, equality in the kinds of resources that are available in the workplace that allow people to do the things that they want to do with their lives, such as have children um, and, uh, and families, and, um, that, and that those things would naturally be more on women's shoulders, absolutely, because of pregnancy um, and uh, some of the things that happen after pregnancy, including breastfeeding, so, um, and perhaps because of women's desires to invest more in their family. So I think that we have to acknowledge that biology if we want to um, make, if we want to have informed policies that could change the world so that women can achieve what they'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, uh, let's talk a little bit about what happens when women are ovulating and when women go from the follicular phase in their menstrual cycle into the uh, luteal phase, right? Uh, so, uh, I've, uh, last year on Age Bears, I have heard that you and Steve Gangstead had a discussion with Lars Penke, which who I already had on the show before, uh, about the ovulatory shift hypothesis. That is, yeah, y uh, you you say that basically when you uh, women are ovulating, their sexual desire increases toward men that are sort of more masculine, have more pronounced masculine traits, and they could be men other from their partners, let's say. But Lars Penke, yeah. uh, I think he did a study where that result didn't replicate. Sexual drive really, in fact, increases, he says, but, but women tend to direct that sexual desire toward their own partners. So what do you have yeah. to say about that? Um, well, I think he's wrong. Um, I think that they... I think that they um, I think they made there were some mistakes that they made when they wrote up their paper. Um, okay, so the phenomenon. Let's make sure that we under, that that we're clear on what the phenomenon is. Um, sure. So, what we what we found early on. So I, I became interested in um, changes across in women's sexuality across the ovulatory cycle. And one of the first findings that I documented, and then subsequently we saw it a number of times in my lab, was that women's um, sexual desire was not generally turned on more during that fertile phase of the cycle. So it wasn't as if they were just more experiencing more sexual desire. In fact, when we asked general questions about sexual desire that didn't specify to whom the desire was directed, for whom they were desire, to whom, you know, who they were desiring, um, then we didn't find changes across the cycle. However, when we asked them about their attraction to their own partner and to other men, men other than their partner for women who were in relationships, then we found some changes. Um, and specifically, the strongest pattern was that women experienced an increase in attraction to men other than their partners, but it wasn't for all women. So not all women experienced that. Um, it was women whose partners were less sexually attractive. Now, I, you know, that, does that manifest in masculinity? Sometimes, yes. But, but the way we measured it was, was uh, sexual attractiveness. So there was this pattern whereby women who said, you know, he's a great guy, great long-term partner, I like him a lot, but he's not the sexiest guy around. Then that's when those are the women who open up their eyes and, and became attracted to men other than their partner at high fertility within their cycles. Um, 
And the paper that, that you mentioned with um, Lars Penka and colleagues um, showed that there was a change, they found a change overall in general desire. So not what we've seen in my lab. And uh, James Rooney uh, at the uh, at the at, at UCSB, the sister campus, sister University of California campus up the road, has also found changes in general desire. We have not seen that. So that's a bit of a, it's a it's that's a, a finding that sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. However, what we do see every time that we have examined it um, with sufficient statistical power is that women. Are attracted to men other than their partner if their partners are less sexually attractive and that's been we've measured that a number of different ways and it's consistent with some findings that Steve Yankostad stat is doc documented in his lab what Penka and colleagues found was that there was a change overall in desire and then they claimed that they did not find that the changes overall in desire for men other than the romantic partner was stronger for women with less sexually attractive partners. So they claimed not to find that. It's an interaction effect. I don't know what kind of listenership you have, but so there's a main effect, which would be that overall um, at high fertility, you find men other than your partner more attractive, but then there's the interaction, which, it, which is that it depends. It depends on whether your own partner is sexually attractive or not. And they didn't find that interaction. Um, at least that's what they reported in the paper. Um, if you take a careful look at the data, they actually, there are a number of different ways that you could measure sexual attractiveness. And they did what I think was a really diligent um, they, they were very diligent in the way they designed their study and they included all of the different ways that people had measured male sexual attractiveness in the past and they included those measures and then they had a number of different opportunities to test the, the hypothesis um, with the different measures that other researchers had used. Um, <clears throat> and what they, what they showed in the paper was, um, or what they reported in the paper was that there were not statistically significant results when they define statistical significance at a very strict level. Um, so typically we define statistical significance as 0.05 or less, especially for a, a hypothesis that was generated in advance, um, that was predicted in, in advance. Um, and they lowered their, um, they lowered that, they made it more, they made it stricter. Um, in any case, um, that isn't, turns out not to be as relevant as some errors that, that were made in the in the way the data were coded. And there is a paper that is now in press. Um, I would suggest if you're interested, you could talk to Steve Gangestad about it because he's the lead author. He and uh, Tran Din are the authors on that paper. Um, and what they showed is that once those errors are fixed, all of the measures generate findings that are consistent with our initial finding and they are in fact highly statistically robust. So there are some errors there um, and it's going to be interesting to see how Penka and colleagues respond mm -hmm. um, because there is this paper that that is being published, it's in press, um, that uh, shows that they made these mistakes and then in fact the, the findings are, are quite robust, more robust than I would have been willing to bet on in advance. Um, I, you know, it was quite remarkable. So that, yeah, there was a dust up at a conference last year. You must have heard something about it, um, where I presented those, some of the results, some of the reanalysis results. Um, and um, Lars was, um, was, was very um, interested in arguing. <laughs> he was very interested in arguing the point. Um, but now that all of the data are out on the table and there are, there are papers that are being circulated, I, you know, I look forward to seeing how, how they will respond. So um, I was asking you if, uh, okay, apart from this, apart from what we've already discussed, what mm -hmm. are some of the major changes that occur when women start ovulating? Right. Um, so there, there are a variety of things. Um, so we've talked about some of, some of the things that happen in the sexual domain, and that is that women appear to the way of summarizing it that, that I've, um, that I think summarizes a, a lot of the data is to say that women place a premium on men's attractiveness when women are in the fertile phase of the cycle. Um, and so, and that is, um, you can see that in women's preferences for a variety of, a variety of male traits. Um, facial masculinity is not one of them. Um, that was a, a finding, a supposed finding early on in the ovulation cycle research world. Um, and that turns out not to be robust for potentially some interesting reasons. So women don't prefer more masculine faces, but it does look like they prefer more masculine bodies, so other features, and certainly more attractive um, males overall. 
Um, and that's interesting for a number of reasons, including that we tend to think from an evolutionary perspective of attractiveness as being something that men prefer much more than women. But within this narrow fertile window in the cycle, you see something quite different, that women place a premium on men's sexual attractiveness. Um, and that helps to make sense of some earlier findings, including that um, for a, a, when you ask women about long-term relationships, they might say, well, um, kindness, good earning capacity, those are really crucial. But when you ask them about a short-term sexual affair, what do they prefer? They say, you know what, he really needs to be very attractive um, for a short-term sexual affair. And so that that might have something to do with this, the fact that women's preferences are changing and that they're really zeroing in on, on attractiveness on fertile days of the cycle, the days of the cycle when they might become pregnant and pass on whatever those genes are um, to their offspring. Along with those findings, um, there are there's evidence that there are changes in the way that women appear and the way that they behave that might provide others with clues about where they are in their cycle. Um, so we did a study, this is a small study, but um, I think it was just really brilliantly done by a former graduate student of mine named Melissa Fallas. And she um, brought women and men, couples, into the lab. She, at, at both high and low fertility, um, so these were women and their male partners. She had them engage in a couple interaction task, um, which um, involved them slow dancing. So my lab had two um, small spaces with closing doors, so we could let the couple <clears throat> we could let the couple go and and um, be by themselves. They uh, chose a song from a list and slow danced to the song. They took cute coupley photographs, and we had just one chair there, so they'd have to like snuggle in on one chair. Um, we had the man smell the woman's neck and rate how attractive it, it was. And so the idea was that we, if there are any cues of her fertility status, we wanted to expose the male partners to them in the lab to make sure that it was fresh in their heads. And so we did that at high fertility and at low fertility. Um, we also had the guys do a task um, where they rated the attractiveness of other men. And we told them that those men were were other students at UCLA, and those men were either highly attractive, they were very attractive and they're described as very dominant, so it was like a profile rating task. Um, or they were not particularly attractive and they were they were de described more as followers. Um, so they didn't seem particularly threatening. The whole idea was to um, give, give guys access to information within the fertile window that, that their partners might be ovulating, and then also to give to present them in the in the high threat condition with the possibility that there is another man around who might be interested in their partner. We measured the men's testosterone by collecting saliva right when they arrived in the lab and then after um, <clears throat> right before right when they arrived in the lab and then after the couple interaction task and this other task and to look to ch at changes in testosterone. And what we saw was that um, only within the fertile window did men's testosterone seem to respond to that experimental condition. So the men who were threatened with the attractive guys um, and their partners were ovulating, those were the guys who experienced an increase in testosterone. Mm -hmm. and so it suggests that that there are there is something, we don't know which particular feature it was of the woman, but there's something going on with the female partner that the male partner was detecting that is affecting his hormones. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of the possibility that men's and women's hormones are cycling together in some way. Um, now, what might those cues be? We had separately done um, a, quite a lot of research to look at changes in women's body odor. And um, on fertile days of the cycle, women's odors are rated as more attractive by men. We collected odors uh, using a variety of different methods, but the one that we landed on that works the best was to tape a gauze pad underneath a woman's arm and have her wear it um, for 24 to 48 hours, um, not using any scented products, bring those things into the lab, hot, both high and low fertility, we freeze them in the freezer and then we defrost them. We have men come in and smell them, high and low fertility scents, um, using all kinds of protocols to make sure that everything's counterbalanced and so on. And men rate those scents as more attractive on fertile days of cycle. We also did that study with women rating other women's body odors and women rate women's body odors as more attractive on fertile days of the cycle. So scent is a possible cue. Um, there's other research that shows that vaginal odors might also be more attractive on fertile days of the cycle, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
pretty close to the action in terms of being close to the ovaries. So, um, and also pertinent to sexuality. So that makes a lot of sense um, as well. And scent is a cue of fertility across the animal kingdom that we see it in humans isn't terribly surprising, but it was, it was definitely um, something about which um, there was some doubt in science. There was some doubt that there were any effects of hormones in humans, um, or at least um, cycling hormones on uh, women's behavior. Um, the, the, the rhetoric in the, uh, in the literature was that women, women had been emancipated from hormonal control, or humans even had been emancipated from hormonal c control, because we might have, you know, Hormonal nudges is the way I think about it, but we're, it's not strict hormonal control in the way that we see in um, some animal species. And for that reason, researchers thought, well, for humans, it's just going to be completely different. So it was quite revolutionary to find that there are these ovulation cues. So scent is a possible cue. Um, there's a possibility that there are, that voices change um, and become more attractive on fertile days of the cycle. There's some debate about that particular finding. Um, and women uh, behave in, they're more flirtatious. They, they might behave in um, more solicitous fashion. So there's one study that looked at women's dance moves at high and low fertility and purported to show that women were dancing more attractively on fertile days of the cycle. So there, it, and all of those things, so the, the scent cues might just reflect that hormones have action throughout the entire body. And so it would be surprising if, there, if men didn't evolve to pick up on whatever might be associated with ovulation. Um, the other kinds of cues might have to do with women's sexuality being turned on in some way during those fertile days of the cycle. So being more solicitous, being, um, you know, dancing more attractively. Um, and so on. So, so not only are there changes in women's sexuality, but there are changes in the way women behave and appear and smell that other people can potentially pick up on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do women also compete more amongst themselves when they are ovulating or not? I mean, there is there uh, an increase in intersexual competition? Maybe. Maybe. I don't think that one is totally nailed down yet. There are some sort of boutique studies on that um, that are all interesting and quirky. It would be, it, I don't think that that's totally nailed down yet. But there's reason to think that um, if women can detect cues of ovulation in other women, um, there's reason to think that they should compete more with those women if they are detecting those cues. And then if you are yourself in the fertile period and you are competing for especially attractive men or especially attractive mating opportunities, then maybe it makes sense to compete more. I, you know, that one's I think still, still um, being sorted out. So we'll see. Okay. And uh, another question, you mentioned scent as a cue that men might pick up on to, uh, no, not consciously, of course, but that the woman, that particular woman is ovulating. Uh, but that, that has nothing to do with pheromones, right? Because we know uh, that pheromones exist in other species, but in humans, right. that's a little bit more complicated, right? Well, yeah. And so there's a technical definition um, of pheromone um, that probably we don't, that, the, so the, I just think of these as scent cues. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, they are not traveling, you know, miles distance in order to attract mates, um, the way pheromones do in some other, uh, in some other species, maybe not miles of distance, but a long way. Um, and so we're talking about scent cues that are much more localized um, and are probably detected by our brain, by more general um, systems in our brain and not by this by a specific scent detection organ, the way that, that pheromones are, are set up in many species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and another question, since you've already mentioned uh, ovulation and the cues that men might pick up on to mm -hmm. uh, know that women are ovulating, uh, can we say that in humans ovulation is really concealed or, or not? Um, I think not. I think not, you know, as soon as we, you know, is it, is it information that is advertised? Is it information that is easily detectable? I don't think so. Um, but is it, is, is it completely concealed? I think the answer is no. I think we know for sure that that is no, given the, given the scent findings, because that's replicable and um, robust. Um, now, practically speaking, what 
impact do those scent cues have? Um, I don't think that you could be sitting across a cafe table from a woman and know whether she's ovulating. Um, however, if you co-sleep with a woman every night, um, and if you are having regular sexual interactions with a woman, um, then you might notice differences, and, and it could certainly have effects on your behavior. Um, so I think that within romantic couples, it's likely that um, a woman's ovulatory cues are having an effect on their male partner's behaviors. Um, there might be other contexts as well. You probably um, recall reading about the lap dancer study, mm -hmm. um, which showed that women earned more tips on fertile days of the cycle, like $100 more per shift um, on, the, on the fertile days, days of the cycle. Now, we don't know whether that was because they were manifesting scent, you know, so guys who are getting lap dances are getting a lot of information from the woman. We don't know what particular channel of information it is that they might be picking up on that makes them want to part with their money more. It could just be that she's more interested in behaving attractively. And so, you know, that's what's going on there. So that's, but that's it. That's a case where it's not just within the, within a couple, but the guy's getting kind of a lot, kind of a lot of information there. Mm -hmm. But ovulation in women is at least partially concealed. So wh right. why is that the why case? I mean, be because, yeah. because in the book you go through several different hypotheses yeah. like increasing parental investment, avoiding aggressive females, preserving mm -hmm. female choice. Is it the case that any of those hypotheses have more, have, has more evidence behind it than the others or, or not? Um, as of right now, I think those are all theoretical possibilities. Um, and the crucial science to test between them hasn't been possible yet. Um, but that's a, that's a, an amazing, it would be an amazing endeavor to undertake. Um, we do have one paper, um, and it would be an amazing and, and I think very challenging scientific endeavor to undertake. Um, we do have a paper that um, we hope will appear soon. Um, that shows that um, women, and so this is using agent-based modeling, so this is not behavioral data from actual human beings, but, but rather some um, computer simulations. Um, and in the, in the agent-based modeling that we did, what we see is that women who, females who um, display ovulation, so we set up the, the agents so that um, female attractiveness could vary and it could vary across the cycle. And the females who became much more attractive at high fertility, so in essence they'd be advertising their fertility, um, other females when we gave them the ability to aggress against females differentially and, and, um, and, and then we looked at the reproductive outcome. So that woman who is advertising her fertility, maybe males come and mate with her, that might have a positive reproductive consequence. But if she attracts also females who can aggress against her and the way we defined aggression was decrements in the female's attractiveness for a variety of reasons. But if a female can aggress against her, um, then the benefit, the benefit of displaying ovulation was greatly reduced. Um, and so females might be concealing ovulation from others, um, not broadcasting ovulation so, uh, so widely in order to avoid aggression from other females. We'll see, you know, I mean, it's, um, the, it's very robust pattern in the, in the agent based simulation. And we think that, um, we think the paper is potentially going to make a splash. So it might open up a discussion about these competing hypotheses mm -hmm. that, um, that will result in some good science. Great. And what about menstruation? Do we already know why it evolved? What is the, uh, the concrete function that it has or, or not? It's a bit mysterious. Um, it's a bit mysterious. Um, not, uh, not many other species um, bleed, have menstrual bleeding. So you can shed the uterine lining without having menstrual bleeding. Um, it's possible that there are some unique features about human reproduction and about um, um, the co-evolution of, of, the, of the conceptus of the, of the offspring, um, extracting resources from the mother within the womb and the mother sort of trying to not have that baby take, take so much of her, her, her um, so much of her uh, 
takes so much out of her body energetically that she would not that she her future reproduction would be compromised so there's this tug of war between mom and baby and that might have something to do with um the way that menstruation occurs in humans i talk a little bit about that in the book but it's that's a that's a bit mysterious that's one of the mysteries of um of the human ovulation cycle that that is as yet mm -hmm. not solved yeah, you also touch a little bit on in the book on premenstrual syndrome, that mm -hmm. uh, PMS, and mm -hmm. you present the hypothesis that it might have evolved to ward off males. <laughs> Could you tell us about uh, that? Yeah, well, so this is somewhat of a I I might put this in the category of this fanciful hypothesis, um, but it you know but. Hypotheses can be fanciful and still be true, but this one, um, the idea is that um, if a woman is, is having sex with a man over the course of many cycles and not becoming pregnant, then that's a signal to her brain that this might not be a good relationship to stay in. And now we in the modern world have ways of making sure that we you know, that acts of sex don't result in, in reproduction, which is very much the goal for, for many people, many much of the time. Um, so we have technologies that can control reproduction, but our brains haven't really caught up with that. They didn't really, you know, the psychology that hasn't gotten the memo in some sense. Um, and so every time you have this new um, menstrual event, it suggests that your partner or your relationship with your partner is not fertile. And so that women might want to exit that relationship and find a different partner. Um, and that women become somewhat more disgruntled in their relationships, possibly on those days of the cycle would, is consistent with that sort of speculation. But as, as of right now, that's just speculation. Um, I think one of the other big mysteries of human mating is how it is the case that we can that humans can so of course but there's a there's a very high divorce rate we think um but there's also a very high sticking together rate even amongst people who don't ever have children um and those relationships can be sexually monogamous for a lifetime um i think that's a big mystery i think that's really interesting mystery why uh, um, relationships aren't dividing when there are no offspring that are that are produced which is you know if we were looking at an at um if we were looking at any new species that we discover and 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 that was not a feature of their mating we would be shocked um that they wouldn't be dividing if they are not reproducing um so humans stay together anyway um by and large or at least some of the time <laughs> more more than i would expect Okay. And what about uh, their male partners? Is it the case that when women are ovulating, their partners change their behavior as well? I mean, are there more mate guarding strategies that they employ, for example? We, we have found that in some of our research. Um, Steve Gangestad has found that in some of his research as well. Um, so I told you about Melissa Fallis's study that showed that men's testosterone increased. I like that because that was a direct measure of a change in men. Uh, the, one of the problems with the the mate guarding studies is that we're ask all the information is coming from women. So we're asking the women, "What's your partner doing?" And when we find that what she says her partner's doing changes across her cycle, it could be because her, her partner's actually behaving differently, or it could be because she feels differently about the way her partner's behaving toward her. Um, so we, we haven't been able to disentangle that entirely quite yet, but yeah, I think that it's likely that men do engage in more mate guarding on fertile days of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's get to pregnancy now. So during mm -hmm. pregnancy, uh, the interests of the embryo and then the fetus are not always aligned with the interests of the mother. So right. there's a little bit of parental offspring conflict that goes around there. Could you tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about that? So, I mean, I think that you did a good job of summarizing it. Um, and I don't say much more about that in the book than that. Um, one thing I do talk about, however, is mother-daughter conflict. Um, and one thing that is interesting, so in, in a variety of species, um, within cohabiting family units, um, there is sometimes a trading off of different times of reproduction. So it's it's your turn within this um, family unit. It's your turn within this family unit. You look at humans, 
um, so that they're not consuming all the resources so that new offspring aren't being all born at the same time and all perish as a result, for example. Um, in humans, one thing that's interesting is that about the time that daughters are reaching reproductive maturity, moms might be winding down um, in their cycles. And so that coincidence raises the question of whether um, there isn't that sort of reproductive conflict within relationships about who's who gets priority. Um, and mom and daughter conflict during those years, so teenagers and moms are sort of notorious for having a lot of conflict during the daughter's teen years. But it could be that some of that is a tug of war between mom and daughter at, at this very basic biological level. Um, uh, about, you know, does mom have another offspring or is it daughter's turn now? Even though in the modern world, of course, our teenage daughters are not likely to reproduce for, for years to come. Yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the mama bear effect. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mama bear effect. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a, is a phenomenon that was documented by a former postdoc in my lab, Jennifer Hahn Holbrook. Um, and what she hypothesized was that just like a, a mama bear, you know, getting between a mama bear and her cubs, which you absolutely shouldn't do, right? Everybody knows that, you know, you see a bear and then you see she's got cubs, you definitely want to get out of there. Um, and so this, could the same thing be true for, for humans? And might it be, might it be mediated by breastfeeding? So breastfeeding results in a, in a different hormonal profile than ovulation or, or postpartum and without breastfeeding. Um, and so it's likely that it triggers a, a variety of maternal adaptations. And one of her ideas was that it would trigger this mama bear psychology. So um, she designed a study in which women were, who, some women were bottle feeders, some women were breast feeders, and some women were non-mothers. She brought them into the lab. She gave them a stressful task with a, a rude female confederate who was interacting with her, delivering noise blasts to her. And then they gave these moms an opportunity. And so they fed their babies. Their babies were away from them at this point. They, but they gave the moms the opportunity to deliver noise blasts back at the confederate and the breastfeeding moms delivered the loudest noise blasts in return. But their blood pressure remained like calm and steady. So they were cool as a cucumber, but really pissed and letting the other woman know it. So they, so consistent with the mama bear phenomenon. And when I had kids, I have twins. Um, I, Jen was um, a postdoc in my lab at that time. And it, so this was on my mind, but I definitely felt like, I, I mean, I felt like I could conquer the world. And when I was behind and I, so I had twins. And so they would, I pushed them in the, in their double stroller. It was this gigantic contraption. If a dog was coming toward me on the street, I would just look at that dog and say, dog, if you get between me and my babies, you're, it's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I also experienced this sort of calm at the same time that I was feeling very confident that I could handle whatever might come between me and my kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about men? men <laughs> yeah. And what about menopause? There, there's the grandmother hypothesis that yeah. says that basically menopause has evolved because uh, during our evolutionary history, it was important for women to have uh, cooperative breeders, let's say, in the, mm -hmm. in the form of grandmothers in this case. So mm -hmm. what, what about that? Yeah. Um, so, so there's a, there are trade-offs there, you know, one of the things about human mating is that you can think a lot about it in terms of the trade-offs. Um, and there's a trade-off between reproducing yourself, so direct reproduction or favoring the reproduction of those who share your genes, um, including your own offspring. So the, uh, the reproduction of your own offspring, might you have a favorable effect on their ability to do that? Um, so that would be indirect. So your, your own direct reproduction or this indirect reproduction through your genetic relatives. Um, and at some point in a woman's life, um, the costs and benefits are changing, you know, at, at various points in their lives, the costs and benefits of, of those types of strategies are changing. And at some point, the thinking goes, um, after women's offspring have reached 
uh, maturity themselves and might start to reproduce themselves, then the benefit to the mom of having yet another offspring is potentially smaller than the benefits to her own genetic reproduction if she rechannels that effort toward her grand offspring. Um, and so the trade it's it's about the trade-offs and and I think that that is um, a, a very reasonable hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And there are some women that when they enter menopause go through hormonal replacement therapy. What happens yes. to their bodies and maybe a little bit to their minds when uh, they go through that? I am not an expert in this. Um, and I talk a little bit about it in the book. Um, my, I, I've been doing some reading about this. Um, a, a colleague of mine just published a book on this. Um, and. I think, um, so there were clinical trials on hormone replacement therapy that were stopped short. Um, and because women were, it was appearing that, that women's cancer risk was increased. Um, I think they were stopped too soon. Um, and, and the evidence is really looking like they, those clinical trials were stopped too soon. And the, the directive that hormone replacement should not be used or should only be used for a li very limited period within women's lives in order to alleviate uh, symptoms of menopause, that's now being rethought. Um, and so we might actually see a resurgence in the use of, of hormone replacement therapy. But it's not my, I'm not a, that is not my area, and I um, defer to to the MDs to a large extent, although the MDs I don't, don't think have completely nailed it so far. But I think that, that that's going to open up as a discussion again. And it makes tremendous sense to me that it would improve women's quality of life to, um, to maintain some of the favorable effects of the hormones that are decreasing around the time of menopause. Um, so estrogen might very well lead to um, greater, so it might it probably has has an impact on sexuality, might lead to greater feelings of well-being, um, and so I wouldn't I wouldn't rule that out. I actually think that part of the reason, um, some of the some of the things that we didn't know enough about um, when I began doing my research on hormones, um, and that we still don't know enough about. Um, now that it, you know we've had the pill since the 1950s but we still don't know about all of the effects of the pill mm -hmm. um have you interviewed sarah hill yes twice okay good <laughs> okay good <laughs> then you know all about this but but we didn't have adequate information about that i don't think we have adequate information about hormone replacement either um and so that that is something that really needs to change but i think that it comes it came in part from this attitude in research um that um that to the extent that women's hormones had effects on their behavior, they were mi they were minor and they weren't very important. And we're rethinking that. Mm -hmm. We're rethinking that because of my book, because of Sarah's book, and I think that we'll rethink it with respect to hormone replacement therapy as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and when it comes to mate preferences, is the cougar phenomenon real? I mean, older women preferring younger men as partners, does it have some uh, evidence behind it or not? Um, the studies that have been done on this aren't great, um, and, but they're suggestive. Uh, and so one thing that I would say that makes theoretical sense to me is that as a woman is, is nearing the end of her reproductive years, that her body might be saying, you know, I think you got one more, one more chance. And so it might turn on sexuality in a different way. Um, as women are are winding down in their reproductive years, so you know maybe there's something to that. Mm -hmm. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. Okay, so just one last question, and circling back to the beginning of our conversation, I guess mm -hmm. that, for example, when we talked about hormone replacement therapy and mm -hmm. its side effects, we are dealing with health issues. So I guess that. It's also important for people to know these sex differences because sometimes they have health-related yeah, implications, ab right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I one of the examples I give in, give in the book that I talk about in the book um, is that we now have um, a very effective treatment for men's main bedroom complaint, right? Which is um, erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So we have Viagra. 
works, works great. Um, but for women's main complaint in the bedroom, which is low desire, we don't really have anything. The one thing we have is pretty terrible. Um, something called phlebanserin, which is, I talk about in the book and explain why, you know, it, you can't drink, which, you know, kind of, you know, puts a damper on the wine and roses kind of idea. Um, and it only makes you want to have sex one more time per month. <laughs> and you have to take it every day and it makes you dizzy. So there's a whole variety of things that are a problem with this, but that's the main thing we have after plenty of opportunity, I would think, to be able to solve that problem. And it could be because we're lagging in some important ways in our understanding of hormones and women's behavior. So I think absolutely there, there are clear health implications here. And I should just say, in case some of your listeners are wondering, you know, so why are we lagging? Why, why do I keep saying things like this? Um, part of it is because um, females are actually left out of research because of their hormone cycles, ironically. Um, from my perspective, given that that is what I want to understand, but um, in in rodent studies, um, fe- males were studied to the exclusion of females, and it, uh, dogs, male dogs were uh, studied to the exclusion of female dogs, um, because once you understood the psychology in the male, thought, well, you know, that's just the default. Maybe that you know that probably applies to females as well, and they were left. Females were left out of the research because their hormone cycles were thought to be too messy. Um, you know, because they're changing, men's hormones are changing, but just a little bit every day, whereas women's are changing, you know, a lot over the course of a month, then they mess up your tightly controlled experiment. Um, But they have to be studied in their own right, because women's and men's bodies and their health um, are different and controlled by different factors. Mm -hmm. And that also applies to mental health issues, because we we are talking here about mostly uh, mostly about uh, changes in women's behaviors and women's mm-hmm. women's psychology. So. so absolutely, I would think so. Um, there, um, there's some there are some interest in in um, cigarette smoking um, addiction um, cessation um, cigarette um, smoking cessation and addiction research um, looking at whether women m- might find it easier to quit on some phases of the cycle um, and that's still an open question we published a meta-analysis last year that looked at um, that looked at the evidence to date and, it, and it's still fairly mixed but I think there might be something really interesting in there um, about the kinds of interventions that women, attempt to undertake in their lives and how they might time them with their reproductive hormones or how taking exogenous exogenous hormones in the form of the pill or hormone replacement might have an impact on those things as well. Mm -hmm. So as a feminist, would you like to leave any final message to people that might be listening or watching the show uh, about what we've been talking about? Oh, um, I would say that that From my perspective, the more you know, the better you are able to achieve whatever it is that you, the more you know about yourself, um, the better you are able to um, hack around the biology that might be nudging you in one direction or another and use it for your own pur- for your own purposes. So if you know that that sexuality is different in different points in the cycle, then you could harness that information for your own pleasure. Um, if you know that you might be tempted to stray from your romantic partner during certain points of the cycle, you might harness that information in order to avoid that situation, or maybe you embrace that situation. Um, but but understanding yourself is both your right and it's also really handy because you are better able to know what is directing your behavior, know what the nudges are and um, exploit them or avoid them as you wish. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's end on that positive note, Dr. Hazelton. And again, guys, the book is Hormonal, The Hidden Intelligence of Hormones, How They Drive Desire, Shape Relationships, Influence Our Choices and Make Us Wiser. And would you like just to mention what are some of the best places on the internet for people to find your work? Oh, um, well, uh, let's see. Um, they can. You can go to my website, my UCLA-based website, um, I could give you the address if you would like to post it. Um, if you, um, so 
So that would be one place. If, if you'd like to find my research, you could type my name into Google Scholar. You'll find my Google Scholar page, and that has a comprehensive listing of all of my research, of all my journal publications. Um, my website, my academics web website is a little outdated, but it's going to be updated soon. So I hope that um, people will check back. Okay. So Dr. Hazelton, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It was yeah, a pleasure. Yeah, no problem. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. And I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and main supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klingpi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalanias, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windiger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Labrant, Os Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, and the Asila Deza Araujo, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Verge, Vega Gidi, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.